let's go. Well, welcome, bienvenidos, and of course, Cultivating Voices Live Poetry sends each and every one of you the very best that we can as we enter this new year of 2022. Here is hoping that you and yours are feeling and doing well. Enjoyed an eventful holiday season for all the right reasons. And uh, we're so glad to have you joining us for the opening of our 2022 season today with the first of our readings, our new book showcase. We're coming off of a brief two week hiatus. Uh, we had a fabulous holiday poetry open house uh, in December, took a couple weeks break and here we are back in January to uh, help to help day launch folks whose new books are arriving, traveling uh, during the global pandemic and doing our part to support all of you in getting to hear some of the most remarkable poetry that our members create and put forth into the world. And today, um, I, as always, I'm, I'm deeply grateful for the membership of our poets who join us to read in these different formats that we have on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. It just so happened that the first, uh, the first Sunday for us landed on a new book showcase, but I love the, I love the sentiment of starting with the new books. Well, we aspire to provide hope, community, respite, and support, and exceptional poetry from everywhere that poets are writing. And today, we have this fabulous, as I like to always say, triolet of poets joining us for our first reading of 2021. I want to remind you all that Cultivating Voices Live Poetry started in March 2020 um, in response to the, um, the pandemic shutting reading venues down. And we've begun to uh, expand our offerings and continue to be with you each Sunday so that we can hear poetry from really around the world in either our new book showcase, um, our open mics, our, our, our genuine open mic readings, which many of you here have participated in, and our occasional special event. Well, the chats are live here in Zoom and on Facebook for those of you who are watching us. So please uh, send the robust love the, the robust and respectful love to our uh, readers today. And of course, um, if you're interested and we, we, we know you will be, and we hope you can uh, purchase, um, purchase their collections and uh, Arden's collection is on pre-order right now. So please, please um, be generous and add folks collections to your, your ever increasing poetry collection. Well, let us turn to today's featured poets. And again, uh, I can't, I couldn't be happier than to begin our 2022 season with the opportunity to introduce a person who uh, is, is really uh, a, a constellation all unto her own as the host of another very, extremely popular uh, reading series here in the United States, but of course, with an international flavor uh, because of the reach of 
of, of the digital platform. And I am talking about none other than Kai Kagan. And it is a great pleasure to welcome Kai back from uh, la your last appearance here with us last June as one of our featured poets on the Poetry Pride Parade. Kai is, be, is, is just kicking off a, a, a wild and, and wintry and starry-eyed uh, book launch, book tour, and we're so excited to have, to be part of, to part of the excitement and enthusiasm around helping you launch your new book. Well, here's a little bit more um, in detail. Kai Kagan, she, her pronouns, is the author of four poetry collections. Most recently, the one you'll hear from today, Mining for Stardust from Flower Song Press. And you also heard here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry, her read from Incandescent, which was from Sibling Rivalry Press in 2019. She is a queer woman of color who thinks Black Lives Matter, a teaching artist in poetry with the Arkansas Arts Council and Arkansas Learning Through the Arts. And I am always happy to promote and encourage and remind all of you that Kai is the host of the longest running consecutive weekly open mic series in the United States. Wednesday Night Poetry, which pivoted very quickly as the pandemic hit. And I am I would be surprised if each and every one of you uh, had, not part, had not partaken at some point on the incredible platform that is Wednesday Night Poetry. Kai was recently awarded a 2021 Governor's Arts Award and named Best Poet in Arkansas by the Arkansas Times. Her fierce and deeply powerful poetry, those of you, you've heard it here, have been nominated four times for the Pushcart Prize, as well as Bettering American Poetry 2015 and Best of the Net 2016 and 2018. And her poems have appeared or are forthcoming in Poetry, Cultural Weekly, Solstice, The Bellevue Literary Review, Tab, Entropy, Swim, Split This Rock, Sinister Wisdom, Lavender Review, Tupelo Review, West Trussell Review, and many, many other poetry locations. Kai is also the associate editor at the Rise Up Review. She lives with her wife and their two dogs in the valley of the small mountain in Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Would you please welcome our first reader of 2022, Kai Coggin. Oh my gosh, how cool is that? I get to be the first reader? That is amazing. Thank you so much, Sandy and Dawn and all of you here at this beautiful Cultivating Voices community. As I said in the sound check, um, I live in a rural part of Arkansas. So if my voice and my picture do not match, then just close your eyes and listen <laughs> so it doesn't bother you. Um, but I am honored to be here. Thank you for the space to share for my brand new book, Mining for Stardust. It came out in November and I am deep in this virtual tour. It's It's been pretty cool. I have nine shows in these 10 days. Um, I'm, in, I'm on my fourth one of these two weeks. And so this is really um, an honor. Thank you so much to Sandy and Dawn for keeping this going. I know what it's like to, to host and to cultivate and to keep a community going. I know that there's a lot of work behind the scenes. So thank you for all that you do. And of course, thank you to all of you in the audience that are here sharing a part of your Sunday uh, with all of us. So this book I wrote um, about the pandemic, during the pandemic, and it was because of Wednesday Night Poetry, having a poem to share every week that's how this book was born. I, the first poem was written on the first day of lockdown. 
And it takes the reader through this collective trauma that we all experienced together during 2020, grappling with the pandemic, um, the season of protests, the US presidential election, and what seems to be us coming back on the other side of such a dark, dark time. Of course, we are not out of it yet. So a lot of these poems are definitely still very much a part of our everyday lives. Um, I'm gonna start with a poem in the garden. And since I live in the national park, just here with my wife, a lot of our time was spent in the garden. This is called Planting Seeds and Tasting Flowers During the End of Days. We plant seeds in the rain today, a slow drizzle falling on our faces as we bend over the little herb garden bed. We share a pair of green knee pads, both wearing one on our right leg like the uniform of some rogue gardening gang. The rain beads on our slick jackets as we sprinkle arugula, spinach, basil, thyme, and I cannot help but think of the ancient line about the wise man planting a tree under whose shade he will never sit. And in these days of darkness and death, is this simple act of planting seeds an act of survival? I pull myself from that thread of thought and come back to the rain falling gently, the cool breeze and my gloveless hands, how I want to feel the dirt cake my palms in meaning. I want to feel the earth merge with my skin, I want to take in this cycle of birth and blooming, I plant my palm full of seeds and shuffle the soil gently with my fingers like a spell of hope cast in the grains of terra. We plant red star and white cypress vines for the hummingbirds and I can already see them climbing and swirling the stone wall and bamboo spilling over like a watercolor. I go inside and pour each of us a shot of soft rose liqueur in the hand-printed geisha glasses I got in Japan at the airport. We swirl our wrists like climbing vines and taste flowers, roses on our lips. I've learned when you say cheers with someone, you always look the other person in the eyes. And her eyes are so blue out here, it's like a new day against all this gray. I kiss her and the rain kisses our cheeks and kisses the newly buried soon to be herbs and our first seed planting phase is done. Next, sun. Phase two in the new bamboo walled garden is a little more technical, less willy nilly, serious business. She has mapped out an intricate color coded seed distribution model, studied the antagonists of beets and Russian pickling cucumber, charted the friendliest neighbors for dragon carrots and radish. And we make the map to scale with our hands and hearts in the dirt. She handles the climbers, trellis training them even as embryo, the snow peas, the empress and sultan green crescent beans. And who knew that these tiny things could be so majestically named? What if we all knew our majesty at such an early age? What if we all knew before rooting who we would flourish next to and who would leave us broken? Garden philosophy. I plunge my finger into the soil in precise but artistic regions, following of course the meticulous color mapping and I drop the little dreams of harvest into their respective holes the prize bok choy and black beauty zucchini, the long cucumbers, rainbow chard and celery. And I have never planted seeds like this in a garden like this. And I will just add this to the infinite list of moments of beauty she creates and cultivates with me. And we smile at each other as we push these little hopes into the earth. As she finishes up, I pick a handful of bright red bud blossoms off the tree and cup them in my soil caked hands, the colors so profoundly pink. We share their succulence and sour, literally tasting flowers. We water all that we have laid into the ground, hoping for their breaking open and reaching for the sun, knowing this year, this dark, dark year, we will not go hungry, whatever may come. 
Lazarus. So this book is pretty chronological and I took it upon myself kind of unintentionally to be um, a scribe to write about what was going on, what was unfolding each week for all of us because of Wednesday night poetry. I felt that I was sort of spearheading this um, arrow of thought, of energy, of poetry. And so I was, I was really leaning into writing about our experience and what we were going through collectively together. Lazarus, it's Palm Sunday, a movable feast that has been moved inside, minus the palms, minus the hands, minus the peace. And I speak only in these fragmented psalms, but my palms ache to touch you. Bring my fingers to bless your cheekbones. Sweep your eyes with supple thumbs. Cradle your neck and pull you into me, our passion play. I lay myself down at your holy feet. Bend my fronds under your weight. Lazarus me with your kiss. The lines of my hands shape words into worlds that want to blend with yours. Fortune tell a sense of longing and loss, and we are all just islands of want. Around the world, palms are empty, in waiting, in desperation, in quiet, prayered plea. We scrub and we scrub, soaping the hope we will not become casualty. And lately, this theme pervades all my poetry. These hours, months, days, weeks in solitary. The fox comments on proper burial procedure at 100. I'm sorry, the fox comments on proper, proper, <laughs> the fox comments on proper burial procedure at 10,000 dead. I rake a path through the woods, change the energy of the land move leaves and earth with the sweep of my hands, layers of seasons crunchy brown, the wet before year yellow decaying until I hit pure ground, dark dirt. Winding and curving the soft wet forest in silence, one rake sweep uncovers the sun bleached bones of a quick fox. Years white fade blaring bone bright against the mud colored floor. I see the shape of him beautiful fox, the movement, the grace of his fossilized grandeur, his delicate hind leg, maybe a shoulder blading through the grass, vertebrae articulating something I haven't the words for yet. I pick up a tiny white backbone, hold its weightlessness in my palm and turn it in my fingers against the glint of fading day and I remember the headlines out of New York City this morning. Contingency plan, 10 coffins for each trench, New York City Park. The words dignity and only temporary flash in my eyes as light bounces off bone and there is nowhere to bury all the bodies. There is nowhere to bury all the bodies. And I think of the American shut-ins, balcony howling in unison each night into the open sky to thank the essential workers, beating their pots and pans and hands together like the tribe vibration is returning to them. The thread is thicker than the threat that comes for us all. My heart sets itself on fire and I howl. I scream so loudly the birds explode from the trees and the mountains sing back to me. Ow! I lay the fox vertebrae back in line with the fox spine. I leave him as whole as I found him and cover his bones with the pure black earth. I hope our 10,000 dead countrymen receive the same dignity, wholeness, and rest. I'm going to just keep powering through here. So I. I, I wanted to name um, the benchmarks, the, the milestones that we came to. I wrote a poem when there was 85,000 dead. I wrote a poem when there was 100,000 dead. And um, I'll read that one. It was actually Memorial Day when we hit 
100,000. And to think that now as a country, we're approaching 1 million is almost unfathomable. And we sort of just stop registering that these people, these numbers were people. They were moms and dads and grandmas and aunts and sisters. So I tried my hardest just to, to put their stories um, into these poems so that they weren't lost. I wanted to make a living archive. Um, so today, especially because of what's going on uh, with o Omicron, um, I wanted to share this poem in this space. This is called Makeshift Memorial, written on Memorial Day. We crossed over the 100,000 mark like it was just another Tuesday. No fanfare, no flourish of flowers left on 100,000 graves. Funeralless limbo walkers who disappear like a fog into the history we are writing with our collective inadequacy to be decent to each other. A memorial is an object which serves as a focus for the memory or the commemoration of something, usually an influential deceased person or a historical tragic event, Wikipedia. From behind a mask, I whisper 100,000 names on the day we call memorial because something should be done to remember the living as they slip away, the uptick in numbers that were never just numbers, but bodies full of breath, full of breath, full of breath, knees and arms, ankles and bellies, cheeks that dimpled at smiles, gaps in teeth, snores when she sleeps, feet that once learned how to tango, earlobes once kissed in moonlight, curls of hair, silkened to white, his aching back that worked so hard in the fields, her childbearing hips leaving children behind, hands and hands and hands that reach out for mine in my mind, not just numbers, but human beings, reduced, reduced, reduced until the only common denominator is how quickly they are forgotten in this pandemic pandemonium. I can't sit with that. No, not today. On Memorial Day, we remember those who fought for our country and died, but half of the country forgot those fighting in ICU beds just to stay alive. The collective death toll of our last four wars and half of the country just doesn't wanna quarantine anymore. 100,000 dead while America throws pool parties, beaches and boardwalks swarm with shoulder to shoulder crowds who dismiss the safety of the future for the party of now. Because this is America, land of the free and don't tread on me and nobody's gonna tell me to wear a mask. And all of those soldiers who died in all of those wars, I guess America can tell them it's just too much to ask to protect one another and help slow the spread. So happy Memorial Day. 100,000 of us are dead. A mass grave of indifference. Red capped rebels drinking their bleach cocktails. And they are here, banging on the door of my reverence to the lost, waving their AR 15s on the capital steps of this poem. And I breathe them out. And I breathe them out. And I breathe them out. I build a makeshift memorial in my heart for the lives we have lost. Photos and teddy bears and scraps of poems. I light 100,000 candles in the pit of my rib cage so that when I speak, only the light of them releases into the dark night of this country. I dance with their 100,000 ghosts. I lay their favorite flowers at all of their perfect feet. In the language of heart, I know their favorite flowers. And I lay a bright, she loves me petal on each of their perfect lips so they can breathe easy, easy the ethers of beauty while they rise into becoming anew. We have to give them that grace, even just a thought, a well wish into the stars. We have to give them that grace. Tomorrow in America, a new story named George Floyd will take our focus will move us into fury or collapse us into numbness. But today, today, I am a makeshift memorial, a mouth full of epitaphs, a funeral pyre burning the sound of 100,000 names into the history of a country too quick to forget. 
So as I was writing that poem, George Floyd was being murdered on television. And the, po the book takes us through that. It pivots, it shifts to the summer of protest. There's, there's a praise poem for black women in here. There's a lot of poems about, about the protest and then it moves us into the presidential election. Um, I want you to know though, also this book is covered with love poems, love poems for my wife, poems in the garden, poems about bluebirds. And I wanna end us with, um, with a love poem if I can. Do I have time for one more, Sandy? Okay. Um, 2020, I actually got to get married. I married my wife, Joanne, in 2020. We married on Zoom. And forgive me if you've already heard this poem because I love reading this poem at any reading where I can. Um, but that was one of the big things that, that always will be special for me about 2020. And um, so we got married on Zoom. We didn't have to pay for catering, but there were people all over the world that joined us for free. <laughs> and it was just us and our little dogs and our justice of the peace. And it was, it was perfect. And this is the very first poem in our 13 years that we've been together that I got to call her my wife. So I'm gonna end with this poem. Thank you, Sandy and Dawn. And I look forward to the other readers. This is called Filling Spice Jars as Your Wife. It seems like all my poems after this will be different. They will hold a different weight, like how the weight of my heart has shifted into indistinguishable float, into lifting cloud, into weightless flight tonight as the rain gently falls on the summer heated tin roof, the din of casual raindrops and warm low lights glowing and wind blowing through the house. We have all our doors and windows open. We have all our doors and windows open and I am pouring spices into glass jars, coriander, cinnamon, cumin, ground sage, and it's hard to define this moment within the confines of a page. Tiny hills of vibrant color and intoxicating fragrance and you hear the cadence of my heart from the kitchen where you build perfect fitting slip in shelves for our spices over the stove. You match the colors, you match my colors to yours. I have all my doors and windows open to you. I have all my doors and windows open to you and you have come all the way inside, sat down at the table of my deepest desires and lit a fire to warm us both. The wind blowing through the house, the rain gently giving way to turmeric sunrise. And you, darling, you are my wife. You are my wife. And it's like I have been waiting my whole life to say these words. I feel held in a way I have never felt before, to look down at my fingers, dusted with ginger and thyme, and see the gold of my wedding band glint and shine in the warm low light glow. I am yours and you are mine, promised on Zoom in our garden of giant zinnia and hummingbird vines, sung out in the morning song of bluebirds. This union that ripples love out to the world and infinities back into us again, love in the fine powder of these spices, ground up essence of oregano and basil. I see our love in every atom suddenly, and every cell in me finally exhales. And perhaps that is the wind. Perhaps that is the wind blowing through the house, this release of eternal searching and finding you there, calling me your forever, naming me your always, to have and to hold, till death do we part and start all over again, looking only for each other's hearts taking my life in your hands eternal, marrying me to the heavens, latching me to the star trail of your white dress in this orbital dance, this lift and spin, this knowing from within that all of my poems after this will be different because you are my wife. Thank you everyone. Stay safe out there, mining for stardust. I'd love to sign one for you. Thank you so much. I'm, 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 I'm a little, as Barbara Streisand would say, verklempt. Oh my gosh, I got 
I, I love that. I love that poem so much. And I'm so grateful every time I get to hear it. I've gone to hear you read it a few times. You know, I tell folks often and have been doing this before the pandemic, but certainly throughout the pandemic, that joy and sorrow are always holding hands. Yeah. And that Mining for Stardust is, is a book that certainly demonstrates that so poignantly um, for, all, for, for all of us. And every name, every heart, uh, every intention that the book inspires and remembers um, is, is just, is, is truly a testament to the space that you, that, that you hold and that you've observed um, in your work, not only as a poet, but as a poet who holds space for other poets. I'm very grateful that we have, we have the record of mm -hmm. last year in the, in the, in the, in the guise and the disguise of mining for stardust. And it seems so appropriate, as I said, that we would begin the first reading mm. of this year with that poem in, in that garden that mm. is reminiscent of, of, of how we continue to need to cultivate things together. Absolutely. So that we can continue to move with hope and resilience. And your reading demonstrated that today so beautifully. Everybody, Kai Cog and the book is Mining for Stardust. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandy. I always appreciate how intentional and sincerely you listen. That's the one thing that's so beautiful. Well, there's so many beautiful things about you, but as a host, your sincere and, and true listening and taking in of our work is something that is so, we're all so lucky to have. So thank you for, for this space and for cultivating this communi community. Well, we'll see you very soon. Thank you. All right, my friends. We move to our second reader, and uh, I love—I just love this reading. I love this reading today. I've been looking forward to it, and uh, Arden, Eli Hill, and I have been corresponding for <laughs> what seems like months to to bring Arden to the stage, and it's so fantastic that um, uh, this pairing of you with Kai and Jude, it just seems so appropriate for today. And uh, uh, so, so welcome, my friend. So good to see you. And a little bit more about Barton Eli Hill for all of you who haven't had the privilege and honor of, uh, of corresponding the way that I have and being introduced. Uh, over um, over this past year. Well, I also have to say that Arden has probably provided one of the best bios I've ever had to be able to share. So get ready, friends. Arden Eli Hill, despite being from Louisiana, has never wrestled an alligator, only a kangaroo. Arden has published in places such as Willow Springs, The Western Humanities Review, Kaleidoscope, Breath and Shadow, and the which is the Lamb and the Lambda Literary Award winning anthology, First Person Queer, as well as the sequel, Second Person Queer. I'm going to put out there that you will be in third person queer too. Let's just let's just put that out there for everybody. As well as Hip Mama, the Wellesley Review, Strange Horizons, and most recently in McSweeney's Internet Tendency. We eagerly, and I say we because I'm part of that we, eagerly await Arden's first, the publication 
of Arden's first chapbook, which is now in pre-order. Here's the title, my friends. Love it. Bloodwater Parish. Bloodwater Parish, which is an exploration of race, gender, sexuality, and adoption in Southern Louisiana. And it is from another of our national treasures, Seven Kitchens Press. And my friends, in case in this bio, you are still thinking about that kangaroo, Arden One. Would you please welcome Arden Eli? <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Um, I wanna make it clear that the kangaroo did start the scuffle. Um, and uh, wow, are they big. They look hunched over, but when they stand, they are quite intimidating. Um, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sandy. Uh, thank you, Kim and Don. Um, absolutely, thank you, Kai, for reading. And Jude, I'm very excited uh, for, your, for your reading next. Um, also, thank you to everyone here today. Um, I am uh, you know, originally from Lafayette, Louisiana, uh, but I am zooming in from my current home of Lincoln, Nebraska, which is the past, present, and future home of folks like the Ponca, the Pawnee, the Dakota, Lakota, and other indigenous nations. Uh, my collection, Bloodwater Parish, is available for pre-order. There were some COVID delays, unfortunately, so I don't have a copy of it in front of me, um, but I would be very happy, I would be more than happy to reserve books for folks. Uh, just reach out to me in the chat or by email. Um, I'll, I'll get that posted at, at some point. Um, and I will reserve you a copy, sign you a copy, and get you uh, a copy. So uh, a little bit to kind of further situate me in my work, um, I am adopted. Um, I look uh, very startlingly like both of my adoptive parents. Um, I'm white, my dad's white, uh, but my mom has European and Filipino ancestry. Um, and in, because I look so much like these folks who raised me, uh, people are, are always surprised to hear that I'm adopted. So this first poem is, uh, is titled, Four Adopted Children Who Look Like Their Adoptive Mothers. North, where what the river carries up of the ocean has lost its salt, where are you from, repeats when you answer Bloodwater Parish. The question loses its emphasis on you, focuses on from. South, when you were young, no one asked. Women said, I bet I know who your mother is. You weren't surprised that they were right every time. Once though, maybe the first time you misunderstood and thought they meant we know who sent you out when you were born. You scanned the room, curious, but they weren't talking about blood. They pointed you back to the same old mother you'd always known, her face as familiar as your father's, as your own. North, where what the river carries up of the ocean has lost its salt. Where are you from is a question that implicates your mother, asked by people who have never seen her, who want to know what it is you look like, who want to know what it is she is. What's your mother is a question from home, too asked by kids when you grew older and adults weren't always listening. No one asked you what you were being as you were so obviously your mother's. So as I said earlier, um, I am living in Nebraska, uh, but strangely enough, uh, my daughter uh, who was also adopted, um, we were born in the same Metairie, Louisiana hospital. Um, our birth mothers had dramatically different experiences um, and while there have been some great changes around adoption in terms of reducing shame, um, providing kids with medical information and things like that, uh, there still remains a, a very high need for support around the people who adopt children out. Um, so this poem is called uh, Lakeview Hospital, Metairie, Louisiana. 30 years before Katrina, and some minutes after midnight, I emerge from the womb into brightness and white gloves. The month was mild, the lake a milk-hungry kitten lapped the shore. There were incubated hours before the lawyers called my parents. Nurses cooed, janitors smiled at me through the glass. When I am young, my parents and I drive past the hospital, sometimes on our way elsewhere. 
I look up at its windows, watch the lake view sign grow smaller. I get home, find the place on a map, and count the blocks between buildings and Lake Pontchartrain with its almost endless bridge. Between water and city, there is grass and the levee. So much is growing, so much is going to break. I have been very lucky to grow up around folks with disabilities. Um, and this poem is about an uncle of mine who I remember fondly. Um, he wrestled with some demons and they contributed to his premature death. Um, but this poem is called Uncle's Leg. He blew it off with a shotgun as a boy. After he lost his parents, after he moved in with his aunt and uncle in Iowa where the land spreads out like a mouth howling. I remember his right leg clearly and the left, the freckled thigh and hairless calf, but nothing of the space between the unseen place his femur rested against or the bone that must have almost pushed from skin as he grew and outgrew plastic limbs. I remember watching the biological limb stride beside the other, the artificial leg that could perform as needed, the prosthetic. Like my adoption, we didn't talk about it often. Downplayed substitution and the impact of biology. Why dwell on severance, the past, when the present pulls us onward? I loved the strange leg best and thought of it sometimes trotting next to my mother when strangers told us how we looked alike, a perfectly matched pair. And uh, a little more context for this next poem. Um, I am transgender. Uh, essentially, I'm a guy who grew out of a Southern girlhood, which was uh, a very interesting experience for me and probably for everyone else who has had a Southern girlhood. Uh, in addition to gender and sexuality, I have come to realize just how astoundingly crucial factors like race and social class were um, both for me and uh, the realms of those who raised me. Uh, so this poem is uh, titled Creole. I know you were born without your birthright language. Aunts and uncles snap the heads of crawfish off telling secrets right in front of you. Your mother withheld mother tongue as America reached southward into each parish's grains of rice. But there are words for me. There is a grammar for my body grown different from expected. Still, you stumble over boy and girl, say things like, when you were a girl, well, you were a girl. As if words like child don't exist in what is now our language, as if there are no children, only sons and daughters. I am your only son or daughter, your neither nor both and descendant, the sole inheritor of the time now gone, holding your hand when I was too small to speak, before I was fluent. This next one is titled Field Trip. It was the way we were told to look with awe, the awful procession of Catholic girls led through gilded hallways. Even my dark hair was blonde enough that day, passed for golden like the gold leaf chandelier. It was the way blood red roses in the vases had their thorns clipped. The many rooms of the house were heavy with silver and antiques. The slave quarters were furnished with items from the Salvation Army because quilts had rotted, wooden implements like women, children, and men had been sold. Except the whip, the whip still there, but hidden, written about. Occasionally slaves were whipped for stealing, says a brochure. Says a white woman in a long gown who complains about the oppression of her corset. Stealing food, the whip whispered to me. Hands whipped captured backs and breasts for surviving. It was the way we were we and they were they. And we could all picture ourselves drinking tea from the china cups. Even Anne, who lived in an apartment and whose grandmother paid her tuition, but whose mother didn't wash her hair. It was the way Emily, Emily Marie said she wanted to get married in a dress as white as cotton on the balcony of the plantation, looking out for miles over the fields, picturesque and romantic to little white girls not taught history and to their white teachers. 
It was how the way the past was the present was not mentioned. It was the way we were indistinguishable, ignorant, we who walked through the graveyard thinking we were in a garden, we who walked through the front door of the mansion across a false history and over the body of what is bent and serving us still. This uh, next poem uh, is a response to a uh, Facebook uh, compliment. Uh, it's called, I don't see you as queer, erasure as compliment. You say you don't see me as queer. You can't see me, I'm the ghost of a girl gone in the glistening silver. We wore white and rabbit fur, kid leather gloves and tennis shoes lost beneath the folds of our beaded gowns. Too young to be brides, we processed on a float drawn by a tractor down litter-lined streets. With boxes of Mardi Gras doubloons and plastic beads by our sides, we threw favors to the crowd. I was the debutante mouthing, show me your tits. I was the one pitching hard. Blue boys. The boys are turning into mermaids water weed, wigs, clenched, tense feet like fins. All the mermaids are swimming downward, weight carrying flesh. Their nipples harden in the cold like pearls, like bully hearts so small and tight, teenage fists, all the boys. All the beautiful boys, they become diving birds, air rush and breaking tense surfaces. They sink as if the stone on the river bottom is reachable as if it can be pulled up when breath becomes air bubble, when vision becomes gray and murky. Where is the anchor for boys' blue hands to discover lifting from the riverbed? Where is the clarity of future I survived on at 12, sitting up from the enamel casket of a bathtub when I couldn't make myself drown? In the river, the mermaids do not understand the scaleless flesh that accumulates and softens in the silt. Boys become mermaids, dive and rise, become birds, beautiful broad-winged birds. I watch the shadows lifting hollow bones and heavy hearts. An invisible phoenix like a fire plumes from each body. After men pull dead boys from the water, the river looks still and innocent like a bully when he sleeps. In uh, 1994, uh, a white woman named Susan Smith falsely claimed that a black man had kidnapped her uh, two children and a carjacking. She was eventually found guilty of murder, having sent her car into a local lake with both children strapped in the back seat. Poet Cornelius Eady wrote a series of poems from the persona of the imagined black man. With gratitude to him, I've crafted a series of poems from the persona of Susan Smith's car. Um, so I'll just read one of those today. It's called Susan Smith's Burgundy Mazda Number no. 1. I never held a black man, but Susan says he entered me. Her words grip the wheel, turn me into a vessel of horror, a cautionary tale for Carolina white women as they drive tents down lonely roads, check their children's reflections in the rearview mirror. They lock their doors closed as Susan's mouth when the officers ask for any description beyond black. Susan says he drives with the shock of her small sons buckled into the back seats. Do they feel safe in me clutched by car seats, the deck still playing songs from Sesame Street? Can you tell me how to get out of this murky water? My wheels are past the edge, no black man in sight, but Susan's body pressed against me, Susan leaning in, guiding me towards the center of the lake. I am tired of being a vessel of this, tired of being accomplice, as she releases me and I roll deeper into scum and lilies. When I am out of view and the last air bubbles burst, a black man arises in Susan's alibi. She makes him ready to do the act to leave her stranded at the scene of the crime. And this, uh, this is the last poem I'll be reading today. 
so again, a great big thank you to, uh, to Sandy and Kim and Don um, putting this together um, and my fellow readers, Kai and Jude, and to all of y'all uh, showing up today and uh, anyone who is watching this recording later, uh, thank you. This poem is called Pointing. It's hard to orient when, my, when the compass is my rib cage broken open by my Southern heart. Sugar lump means I don't remember your name. Bless you makes bless another four letter word. When the poems came for me, I was surprised at how strong the current pulled. Mississippi, not the Vermilion River's lady, lazy waters, still in spots wedged in concrete slabs beside the falling pier. What if someone reads them, my mother said, to go back to the poems, to go back to the roots that dipped into the waters, the hand that made its way into my body when I was drunk on a pullout trundle trying to sleep off crawfish and planter's punch passed around on a silver platter. I changed my name because what would my mother's friends think if they knew me? What would my family think if I spoke or if I slipped off that pearl and ruby ring to point a finger? Thank you uh, again. Thank you, Sandy, for making this gathering, um, this community and all of these connections. Taking a deep breath again. Again, that is the course for today. Wow. Uh, everyone, my, I, it, it's, it is not lost to me that sometimes I get a recommendation to have a poet on the program. And I'm so glad that my former professor and now good friend, the poet who we've all heard here on Cultivating Voices, Grace Bauer said, you have to have Arnila Hill on the program. Folks, you see why. And Arna, I hope you will come back and read more from Bloodwater Parish. And um, I can't wait for you to have it in your hands so that we also know that we can follow suit and have it in our hands as well. Um, I want to just mention that Arden began with that perennial question of where are you from and really took us on a journey that led to another line that's that's kind of seared in my head from your reading Arden which is there is a grammar for my body um, you know may we all remember from today's reading um, the deepest of intersections that um, happen as we wrestle with all those questions of where am I from, who am I in that constellation of what is not trite things to think about at all of gender, sexuality, race, different abilities, all the many things that populate your poems and make them so um, poignant, not just creative, but absolutely necessary to our consideration of what it means to be human and continue that exploration. Thanks so much, Arden. I really Thank can't. You again. I really, I really can't um, express enough gratitude for um, the reading today. I'm just so moved by the poetry. Well, here we go, my friends. Our final reader for today is, as you've heard me say, when I have the privilege of getting to introduce uh, a poet, a salmon poet, one of my salmon siblings. Uh, I got to hear Jude Nutter read for, for only the first time, although I had known of your work and had your books, but only got to hear you read Jude um, in, in one of our salmon poetry Zoom readings 
uh, honoring the, the 40th anniversary of salmon poetry. And so I'm so grateful now to uh, have been able to bring, um, have you join Cultivating Voices, join the community of or other salmon poets. I know there's some others in the audience today because I saw I, I saw their I saw their I see their names and I I, I see the brethren and sisterhood there. Um, and also uh, to be able to help celebrate and and promote um, the, the poetry of your newest collection, Dead Reckoning, which comes um, uh, almost a 20 year spread between the first Salmon publication and the second Salmon publication. So although there've been many in between. So let me share with you a little more about the work of, of June Nutter. My friends, here is our bio for Jude. Jude Nutter was born in North Yorkshire, England, and grew up near Hanover in Northern Germany. She studied printmaking at Winchester School of Art in the UK and received her MFA in poetry from the University of Oregon. Go figure, right? Many different, many different locations. Her poems have appeared in numerous national and international journals and have received over 40 awards and grants, including two McKnight Fellowships, the Moth International Poetry Prize, the Larry Levis Prize, the William Matthews Prize, the Joy Harjo Poetry Award and grants from the Elizabeth George Foundation and the National Science Foundations Writers and Artists Program in Antarctica. Her first book length collection, Pictures of the Afterlife from Salmon Poetry was the winner of the Irish Listowel Prize and was published in 2002. But that was, and that was followed by the Curator of Silence from the University of Notre Dame Press. Her second collection won the Ernest Sandine Prize and was awarded the 2007 Minnesota Book Award in, poet, in Poetry. The third collection, I Wish I Had a Heart Like Yours, Walt Whitman, is from the University of Notre Dame Press also and was awarded the 2010 Minnesota Book Award in Poetry and voted Poetry Book of the Year by Forward Review in New York. The fourth collection, the one we will get to hear some poems from today, Dead Reckoning was published by Salmon Poetry, 2021. The book has been named by The Telegraph in the UK as one of the test 10 best books of poetry in Ireland and the UK for 2021. She currently lives in Minnesota but, and divides her time between Minnesota and Dingle, Ireland, the fabulous Dingle Peninsula where she has a family home. Would you please welcome Jude Nutter. Thank you, thank you, Sandy, so much. Um, Thank you, Sandy and Dawn, for getting all this going. And uh, Kai and Arden, thank you so much for your wonderful poetry. It's just an honor to be here. And thank you, everybody on Zoom and Facebook for being here to um, celebrate poetry with us and start off 2022. So I am going to read, this is Dead Reckoning, fabulous um, sculpture, sculpture on the cover. Uh, by Culloden Cusson, who's an Irish artist who lives in Dublin. She's in her 90s. 
it's at Brandon Creek on the Dingle Peninsula, which is where St. Brandon supposedly set sail from to discover America and Iceland and Greenland way before um, the Vikings or Columbus, when we don't mention Columbus. Um, so, and I got permission to use this on the, on the cover of the book, um, which I was thrilled about because I've loved that sculpture for ages. Um, so I'm going to read, those of you who know my work know that I like to um, work the long narrative uh, poem with a lot of sort of braiding, um, different threads that sort of braid through. So I'm going to read one poem from the book, which is probably the longest poem in the book um, called Disco Jesus and the Wavering Virgins in Berlin. Uh, the title will sort of explain itself as the poem goes on, but it was actually inspired by uh, something I overheard on television when I was um, sleepless one night listening to the uh, televangelists, you know, on late night television. Um, I like to flick through the, what I call the God channels. And if I hear something that just sort of sparks my imagination or pisses me off, I kind of tune in and listen. So, um, thinking I would maybe get a poem out of it. And this poem came out of something, or several things I overheard this person saying on one of the God channels very late at night. Um, so the title is Disco Jesus and the Wavering Virgins in Berlin, 2011. And the epigraph that goes with it, which sparked the poem is this. Although a man I no longer want, I disown and forget all desires of the flesh. How convenient, I say to the dark, because this is what I do when I cannot sleep, sit in darkness, flicking through the God channels, sneering and answering back, while the neon tetras beneath their flickering tube light weave their Moebius strip through the wet fire of the only world they know. While a man who makes it dishonest for a woman to disown her desires, a man whose body becomes during sex, one long wound sleeps across the hall in a king-sized bed. Every scar is a door and I have never known scars like his, shrapnel, bullet, knife blade. The English I told him once as I placed the welter of my lips to his damages one by one. Assume the French verb blesser, to wound means to bless. And he, without remembering he said it, said, the way in and the way out, the doors to heaven are always small. This is a man who beguiles even the dirt up from its knees, whose hands conjure a body for me out of the body I have, and yet every bed is a deathbed, and yet the only door out of the body is death. Outside a great city and its troubled history under rain. How is it we can be loved so well and remain so famished still? I rejoice says the preacher, in the celibate life, the thought of one day dying into heaven. Behind him, deep in an alcove, washed by slow strobes of alternating color, Jesus, life-size and on the cross, turns from blue to red to yellow, and I am back suddenly at those dreadful youth club discos, all cheap lighting and tinny reverb and hidden pints of liquor, where I once let a boy called Martin nudge his hand centimeter by centimeter as if I would not notice up under my blouse until it came to rest, fingers spread, clamped over my left breast like a fleshy starfish. I let him because he was tall, a bad boy, every girl's crush. And because my desire was beginning to acquire a formal structure. In this life, 
proclaims the preacher as Jesus turns yellow, turns orange, turns green. We are all under siege, beset by temptations. I watch as a single tetra, little morsel of color, breaks from the neon spackle of the crowd and drifts upwards to place the dark foyer of its tiny mouth against the roof of its world. And what use really is this life if it's not one long sheath of longing? We are all under siege, he says, afflicted, bedeviled, assailed by carnality. So let us pray. Let us pray, he says, for the wavering virgins. Now I say it is the poet's duty to wait, to wait in the dark, to wait in the dark at the world's mercy for moments such as this. In the beginning is the word, and the word is sex. In the beginning is the kiss that gives rise to the myth of Eden, that bright landscape unfettered by history that we create when placing our open mouth to the open mouth of another for the very first time. And yet there is no garden in which the lion ever will lie down with the lamb. And like this, the whole body becomes an eye turned to nothing but its own pleasure. And every time we lie down to assuage our loneliness, we find the flesh already there, waiting. And all we ever want to do is undo the violence of this world. And yet that's how we lie down with need and avarice. In the beginning, as I remember it, is a walled garden, staples of croquet hoops punched into a lawn. Beyond in a field, a horse with a tail so long, it brushes the grass. Late summer, farm work, room and board and pocket change for college. Summer's end then, cut fields at dusk and hawks slicing low over the brittle blonde pipes of stubble. So many lives already undone by the round size of the combine. At night from my single bed, I listen to the pauses and the breaks in the bicker of the shower as the farmer's eldest son turns and twists beneath it in the small bathroom along the hall. When I imagine his body, which I do, and often, it's as a series of broad, quiet rooms inside the rattle of falling water. He becomes a man made up of absence. In the beginning, as I remember it, he puts on his boots and wax jacket and walks out with his dog and a shotgun into the fields. I do not remember the gun's report, but if I am not with him, why are there pigeons all flash and clatter breaking for the open? Why do I feel still the sudden change in their purchase on the air? a few seconds of wild churn and scramble before the spin down into the stubble. There is the unlit weight of each skull's chamber, the beaks loose tweezers, the eyes eclipse. With the harvest in, with summer over, with his parents at church again every Sunday, it is inevitable, really. And afterwards we lie like moist kindling under the covers and the world is just as it was, only more so. Over the fields, first mists of September unfurling their aprons, the color of iron. Rooks like black static. A breeze 
heckling silver out of the grass until the lawn is a carpet of knives. It is my job to cut and split and ransack the nave of each bird, which his mother, which his mother will bake with orange juice and honey. Six birds in a wheel on a willow pattern plate, a carousel of pigeons, their bald glazed wings like tiny flippers, and what meat there is, latticed by shot. It is 1978. I am 18. The year Sweden outlaws aerosols and Markov, Bulgarian defector, is assassinated with a poisoned umbrella tip and Egypt makes peace with Israel and war begins in Afghanistan and a man more than twice my age teaches me that the body is its own reward. And these days, I sleep right through the minor disruption of my lover's shower. And when I wake, he's at work, in jeans perhaps, but shaved, with his feet on the table and a folder of case notes before him and his gun, unbreakable heart in a holster against his ribs. The hungers of the body, says the preacher, always lead us astray, so let us pray. Outside, the red crumble of tail lights down Linienstrasse, a great city and its troubled history under rain, the whole of Europe under the same rain. A waver, I once read, is a young tree left uncut during the clearing of timber. Rain somewhere, loosening its clothes to play wanton in the fields. Rain drumming its fingers on the green tears of the, lee of the trees. The loneliness of rain that has come so far, touching only one leaf. And where rain is falling, where there are no leaves, a greater loneliness. Every word for what we are leads us back to this human, from the Latin humus, meaning earth, flesh, from the Greek, related to sarx, meaning earthly, meaning of man set adrift from the divine. Every word for what we are brings us back to the dirt. So yes, I say, let us pray. Let there be buttons abandoning their buttonholes. Let tongues unbuckle, let watches, let belts. May small change fallen from pockets be forgotten, never found. And shy flags of hair swing loose. Storms inside strokes of wind. The world is full of alchemy, so let there be questions and demands. Small talk, dirty talk, language in all denominations. Let keys drop and fingers find every latch and lock and legs peel free from the sheer long throats of stockings. Let hearts be up to their necks in longing. May jackets and shirts turn inside out. May the body in rooms specially rented in cars, on tables, in single beds, on Sundays. Body, believed to be related to Old Norse, buthka, meaning box, as in coffin that goes into the earth. And when the virgins go down, may they go down like heavy crops go down before the cutter, without choice and ripe with rains and sugar. Jesus, abandoned on the cross, alone in his alcove, turns from green back to blue, back to red, while in its tank that single tetra forms perfect circles on the water, simply by drifting to the surface and kissing what imprisons it.
Why, if desire is so perilous, are we given a God so obviously human with an athlete's body, lean and well-worked? A God whose loincloth is slipping, pulled down by its own slight weight over one hip, who has still, despite all that's been done to him, such beautiful hands. A God whose crown is askew, whose hair needs washing, whose wounds will become the most terrible of scars. A God who may well have desired a woman who made desire pay, who may well have been her lover, who dies with his arms wide open. Thank you all so much, very much. Just honored to be here. Oh, I needed that two week break because each of our three readers today has just astounded me in their unique ways. It's always true, but I've been out of practice with the astonishment from the past two weeks. And today, Jude, that contemplative story of the desire of the dark of night on the television screen to hold that one long sheath of longing, as you mentioned, or just grabbed me. I love that question. Now I say it is, it is the poet's duty to wait in the dark and the beginning is the word and the word is sex. It's a feat, no doubt, to be able to write and have a poem, <laughs> but it's a feat to have me waiting for every word coming off the edge of your tongue as you did today. Thank you so much for closing out our read today. It was, uh, as you said, the world is full of alchemy. And I often hope that how we put the readings together will create a sort of alchemy. And I felt that our three poets today in the way that their themes intersected and interconnected did just that, created that alchemy. So everyone, would you please unmute and show your appreciation for Kai Kogkin, Arden Eli Hill, and Jude Nutter for the garden and the grammar of body. Congratulations. Bravo, bravo. Is a door. Everybody was great. Many thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank fabulous. You so thank much. You. Fabulous. Fabulous. Astounding. Astounding reading. Thanks, Sandy. I'm, I'm, I, thanks, Linda. I'm glad you were here to witness this. Yes. Yeah, uh, triumvirate. Oh, it's Always. wonderful. Mm. Well, my friends, while I just make a few more announcements to close us out for today. Uh, feel free to post um, any upcoming readings that uh, you have or announcements that you have in the chat. Uh, please, of course, um, join us next week, next Sunday. Um, not sure if I'll be in Connecticut or back on the West Coast, but please join us for our next reading of 2022. It's our wild card open. Mike, for those of you who are the first to sign up in Zoom uh, before the reading next Sunday will be our featured readers. So be one of our earliest readers of 2022, be one of the first in our open mics of 2022, look for the event page for more details um, on Facebook. And of course, please, uh, bring your poems. Hey, I want to give a special shout out just in a couple hours away uh, at 7 p.m. Eastern. That'll be four o'clock on the West Coast. Uh, and I, I'm 
my my time converter in my head is a little off right now. It's going to be pretty late. Uh, that's going to be about one o'clock over in uh, Ireland in the UK tonight with the West East poets of the pandemic and beyond. Um, our very own Don Krieger is going to be reading this evening with uh, Ravi Shankar, Andrea Carter Brown, and Heidi Seaborn, um, coming right off of the publication of uh, Don's new book. And I, of course, we will have Don for a new books showcase um, soon in the upcoming season. So please, uh, if you are interested, uh, uh, I think we can put some of that information in the chat for you or look on Facebook. Uh, it's on our Facebook page for that reading and register to join us uh, just, in a, just in a couple hours. Well, you have joined us today for Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Again, I can't thank enough. Um, you know, the, the, the themes that we got to hear today um, in the poetry of Kai and and Arden and Jude, I think set, set um, a tremendous stage for us moving forward. I, I really loved the ground that they covered and um, were so mindful of the places that we've been since we began the reading series and likely where we are headed in our consciousness and our humanity and as I always like to say at the end of every reading, you know, our uh, picking up off of, of, of Michael Anthony Ingram's quintessential listening reading series, um, you know, our humanity truly does depend on our deepest, deepest of listening to one another. So I wanna thank each and every one of you for being here today on this first Sunday for us of Cultivating Voices live poetry. I, I in, implore each of you to uh, stay safe, take very good care of your beloveds. And of course, as I say at the end of every time, I have the pleasure and privilege to be with you. Keep writing those miraculous poems. Um, they, they are our they are our lifeboats during these times and uh, we will continue to need them. Have a good week, everyone. And thank you again to Kai, Arden and Jude and as well to Don Krieger, Kim Parsons and to each and every one of you for being with us. We had a great crowd today and I look forward to seeing you next week. Safe travels, my friends.